So we had something big happen earlier this week, yesterday in fact. Got a new website. Woo! And um, hope everybody, some of you may have already had the chance to look at it. Uh, some of you may go look at it right now or may wait till after the show. I do ask that everyone is patient with us. Uh, there might be a few little kinks here that we have to work out. And if you do see an issue, you send us a message on our Facebook page and uh, we'll try to get fixed. It was quite a big undertaking, uh, switching over to uh, a new site. Still same web address, completely different look. Uh, should be a lot faster. Cart page and checkout looks a little different. Yeah, one of the main with. issues we had back during the springtime was uh, we had a lot of increased traffic and our website got really slow. And uh, it was slow moving around the pages. It was also slow on your checkout page and it caused us some issues. We patched as well as we could to get by but now we hope it's going to be lightning fast. Yeah. And the majority of you all look at our web page on your phone. So things have changed over the last few years. We have to optimize for what we call mobile uh, mobile viewers. Mm -hmm. So we have a complete, our mobile site looks kind of different than our desktop version. But anyway, go check out the site, look around. The navigation, everything should be pretty much the same uh, as it was. But uh Go check that out. Comment below. Tell us how you like it. Uh, what you think about it. Uh, we're we're happy, excited about it, and uh, having a new and improved, faster site is going to open a lot of opportunity for us as far as adding that garden planner feature we keep talking about and uh, some other things in the future. Yep, and nothing drives me crazy than taking up my time being slow. So maybe this will take care of a lot of that. I like fast. Fast. Boom boom. Uh, boom boom boom. Boom boom. Um, what's going on? I got corn about hiney high. Hiney high. My I prime sweet corn. I didn't grow any fall corn. I, I mine, Sally whooped mine pretty hard early because it wasn't that, that, that tall, just germinate. But mine's coming around, boy, it's green, it's greener than your shirt is. Uh, and it's, like I said, this is about hiney high. Now, I've been having to spray it at least once a week with spinosad, even though I ain't got any ears, uh, I thought I had them nipped, and then I come back uh, from camping earlier this week and um, got out there, and I saw a little nibble on some leaves, and you can look down in that plant there, and I saw a few bugs in there. You just, if you're growing fall corn, you can't wait on the ears. I'm convinced you can't wait on the ears to get your spinosad program going. You got to get it going early. Yeah, I had a lady call from North, North Florida earlier this week talking about some of her greens or, or broccoli and things like that it was really getting taken over by the worms and she was using BT and she wanted to know what to do. So you got to switch it up. You got to rotate those BT and spinosad. It ain't going to hurt to throw you a little neem oil in there. But I personally like to spray my neem oil one week or one cycle. Sometimes you have to spray more often than a week. You need to be on a five-day rotation because the worm pressure is really high right now. So I told her, I said, shorten your intervals up a little bit. Spray with BT one week or one cycle, then spray with spinosad. And if you don't, you throw your little neem oil in there on either one of them. You got to go to war with them. What's well, interesting about that, that worm deal, especially on your fall winter crops, and we'll, we'll probably need to do a whole show on fall winter pest control. I was talking to Jason at Cog Hill about this. Now, I don't really have any a whole lot of worm pressure on any of my brassicas. And he was saying he used to, but then once he started, you know, understanding the regimen he needed to be on, he really didn't have that issue. And the worms, to me, they seem like once you get control of them and really control them one year, you don't have as much problems in the fall. Yeah, years. I explained to this lady that exact same thing. you got to break that cycle. And once you break that cycle, it gets a lot easier. Another thing is you got to start before you have a major problem. You, you can't go out there yeah. with an organic pest control product and expect to solve a major problem. Then problems don't happen overnight and they're not gonna get solved overnight. You gotta be pre-active. Yep. If you had a problem last year, you can bet your bottom yep. dollar you're gonna have a problem this year and yep. it's best to be proactive about it. Proactive, that's what I was looking for. Proactive. proactive. Yeah. Speaking of corn, going back to that real quick, as I was out there peering at my corn plot, my little, it's just a little bitty patch, four rows, they're about 20 foot long. As I was studying on it, I got to thinking, you know, there's a there's a lot of YouTube gardeners out there, but there's a huge gap 
there is there ain't a whole lot of them that grow corn. Corn's a tough one to grow. A lot of people don't know how to grow corn. Uh, well, that it got me wondering. Now I know we grow corn uh, deep south. They grow plenty of corn. My buddy Alan uh, over at the Texas Prepper Channel, he grows a good bit of corn. But you know, a lot of you, you big famous YouTube gardeners, they don't grow corn, and I don't know why. Is it because they can't grow corn, or some of them are they restrict? Some of them restrict themselves to be really, really hardcore organic, and, and it's hard to feed the corn well enough with those methods. It just got me wondering why some of the big, big YouTube gardening channels are, are not growing sweet corn. Corn could be intimidating to the average fellow. Maybe they don't like sweet corn like we do down here. Ooh, well, man, I don't know. I love it. I mean, you can't. To me, you can't have a garden, and you gotta won't ride by a garden down here. You gotta have they ain't corn. Got a few rows of sweet corn. That's right. So I don't know. Maybe they don't. Maybe they can't grow it. Maybe they don't know how to grow it. Maybe they don't like it. Maybe they just don't have room for it. Should be our mission to let everybody join in on the success of having sweet corn in their garden. Yeah. If there's any YouTubers out there who would like. Me to learn them how to grow some sweet corn. Or teach them how to start learning how to. <laughs> Was that uh, give a man an ear of corn, feed yeah. him for a day, teach him how to grow it, and yeah, feed him for his lifetime. That's right. Uh, well, fall planting is wide open right now. You told me. You I got your stuff in the ground? Man, I'm working on it. I mean, I'm working on it hard. I got it behind a little bit, and I'm trying to play catch up, and it's tough when you get behind. I went hard one day earlier this week and got. A vast majority of my stuff planted, and as I was planting, I realized I didn't have any rutabagas started. I got to get some rutabagas going. Uh, I got a few things I'm missing out on, but I got majority of stuff in the ground. I'm gonna show everybody these pretty puppies right here. But mm. I got some of these in the ground, and we got plenty left over. This is broccoli, broccoli, and show you there what a pretty broccoli transplant looks like right there. Now that that needs that don't that don't need to be left in these trays much longer. Yeah, it needs to be planted. So I got a I planted a whole row of Green Magic, and then I planted half a row of Godzilla, half a row of Emerald Crown, and uh, I got I did two videos on fall planting. I planted some of my stuff in um, my traditional plot where I'm doing the drip fertigation in my no-till plot is where I planted some of this broccoli. I got videos coming on both of those in a few weeks. I'm a little bit ahead on my video schedule because there's been so much going on in the garden, a lot of content being produced. And uh, so the, the things I did this week won't be air until a couple more weeks. Now this tray here is a 162 cell. That means you can put 162 plants in that tray. And these things work perfect. They work wonderful. But everybody out there need 162 broccoli plants. That's right. I don't didn't need 162. No. So here's another alternative for you on that. Let me get the switch around this way. This is that product we brought in last year, and this is a 24 cell tray. And this mm -hmm. is a heavy, reusable. And what I did, because I don't need that many of certain things. If you got raised beds or you got a smaller garden. You may want to go with something like this right here. And what I've got here is I got 12 collard plants and I got 12 dinosaur or lacinato kale plants, mm -hmm. which that's is enough. Good, it's way. enough for most people that's got a, uh, a raised bed or a smaller garden. So this here, and one, another thing about this, these cells are a good bit bigger. So the plants, you can let them get, I don't know if I got them rooted in enough to pull out. But you see how much bigger the plant oh, is. Oh, ain't going on there. You won't. Oh, I'm going to try. This so much bigger. There we go. See there? Yeah. Now See? you're going to have a little more transplant shock with that you one. You do. You do. But you can grow a little bit bigger plant. You got a little more time. Yeah. With that, <coughs> excuse me, with that one right here. Whereas when these get ready like this, that's why I had to get mine in the ground earlier this week. But yeah. You can grow a lot more plants, a lot more space, but like I said, so everybody don't need this many plants. My point is we got something for everybody regardless what size gardener you are. So what I always tell people, if you got room for this kind of footprint, this kind of tray, what you do, you grow out a tray like this for maybe several different varieties of cabbage or broccoli or whatever. You plant what you need, you sell the rest for a couple dollars a plant, you pay for your seeds, 
and and your seed starting trade. Well, if you got a big heart like me, you just give them away. Well, that too. Sometimes you, we've talked about it before. Sometimes you can sell them. Yeah. And you can give them away. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought that was an interesting comparison there of the two two ways you can grow those transplants out. A little bit for everybody. How about that? How about that? Lost Nato kale and collards. Boy, ain't they pretty. I got me some of that plant. If, you, if, if these folks out there that ain't planting collars, there's something wrong with them. And look here, these right here in the greenhouse has not been sprayed the first time with an insecticide or a disease control. Now they've been fertilized properly, but look at their, they, they're perfect. Mm -hmm. Good looking collars. Yep. I got me a whole row of them because I can eat, I can eat a. Ooh, I love them too. I can eat a passel of them. Um, Pretty quick, and, and yeah, if you ain't never tried collards, if you don't like collards, it's probably because you ain't cooked them right, and you never tried growing them. You can grow them just about anywhere. A really, really cold tolerant. You need to have some collards, and it's not because they're so cold tolerant. As long as you got a relatively room temp place to to start your seeds, it's never too late to get some collards started. Yeah, we've to, we've not used this fall. We've not used a heat pad on anything, so we've had sufficient temperature to get good germination on everything in the greenhouse. What about uh, what about you? Uh, you got an update on some onions, multiplying onions? Yeah, if you follow our channel and uh, keep up with our Robo Road Show, you know I've been doing a lot of work with nesting onions and multiplying onions. Last year I had a decent little starter crop. Uh, this year I've got a lot planted. I've got five, excuse me, i got nine 100 foot rows planted right now. Did you and plant them by hand? I did. And then uh, probably by the weekend I'll have three or four more rows planted. So I staggered them a little bit just to see if there's going to be a difference. Plant them a couple of weeks apart. You they, staggered them because that's all you felt like planting one day. Well, that's another reason why. I'm <laughs> telling you, now, I was wore out. My back hurt me. Well, I was well them things, you should have got your little PVC pipe. No, I dibble wheeled them. I laid them out there. I got, I laid my rows out. I got me some chicken litter and put me some chicken litter and incorporated that in. Then I took my dibble wheel, which worked wonderful because I want to plant them further apart this year. Last year, I did notice I planted them too close together. Mm -hmm. So this year, I planted them about eight inches apart. My devil wheel worked perfect for that, so I just run it down through there and laid my space in that for me, and I just dropped them in there and come up. Of course, I had to bend that old back to get them down in there. Yeah. So it was a it was a good Saturday. It wore me out. But I've got a few more to plant. But it looks like we're going, as of right now, it looks like it's going to be a great crop. We're going to have them offer to sell probably this fall. Sell them in a little pack of, what, eight or so? Whatever, yeah. Speaking of dibble wheel, <coughs> so in that no-till crop or plot I'm doing, uh, I still had a good bit of pea debris below that thick layer of compost I added, so I couldn't go in there and make me a traditional furrow for planting without making a mess. So what I did is I took a single dibble wheel and run along where my rows were going to be. Now, if I had raked it and smoothed it and wet it a little bit, it, it would have punctured deep enough put this in, but I had to move a little soil out of the way. But it worked perfect. For that, so for, for those of you that are doing like no-till with compost, market farm and stuff like that, that thing works like a charm for marking off spot for transplants. These pea vines can be a little aggravating and get rid of. They can, well, they, if you put your tiller in there too soon, they'll get wrapped up on that. I just covered mine up and they just breaking down. Yeah, I probably should have done let that. Let nature do their thing. Yeah. What else we got going on? Uh, I got to, I'm, I'm going to be, in fact, tonight, not tonight. I would say soon, next day or two, I'm starting to get some onions in the ground. I know it ain't November yet, but last year I planted some in October and uh, I did just fine. These here, now I showed you some plethora of onions. We showed them last week and those are going to be the first to get in. These right here are going to be right behind them. So I planted these, I think a week or so behind the plethora. I kind of staggered my planting, so I went, had to plant them all at one time. This is a variety called cougar. And like uh, Jason said, he said, you don't want, you got to be careful uh, putting these onions right here around young men. And cougars, you know, get them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this is, this is an old tray we had. This is a... And this is a thick one right here. This is 392. Yeah, it? I'd say that's about right. Anyway, it's not, I don't like it quite as much as that deep 338 we sell, but it's a similar concept. Anyway, we can 
See right there, them puppies are ready to go in the ground. Yeah, I will tell you this. The onions do so much better than the 338 trays than they do the 162s. Now, if all you got is the 162, by all means use it, but they grow out a lot better, I've noticed, in the uh, in the 338s. Yeah, I would say if you're doing them in a 162 just for space reasons, unless you just don't need that many onions. If I was doing them in a 162, I'd put several seeds per cell and then would you? pull them apart yeah. just to get more of my space. Yeah. I mean, there's a heap of onion plants in here. They are. More than I'm going to need to plant. But sometimes you just like to grow a whole tray. Everybody I've talked to said with these cougars, they've been getting awesome, awesome germination. It's a round, big round onion. Um, so speaking of onions, and I don't remember if we covered this when we talked about onions, but right when we put these in the ground, almost just as soon as we put them in there, because now bought onions are a little different because you got to wait on them to start growing, but these you don't. As soon as we put them in the ground, I'm going to start shooting some 20, 20, 20 to them. Just as soon as I put them in the ground, I'm changing my strategy this year. With anything I'm transplanting, I'm not waiting on it to start growing. I'm going to I'm going to hit them as soon as I put them in the ground, and then I'd say about four weeks after, about a month after they're in the ground, that's when I'm going to switch over and just go with some ammonium sulfate on them. Hmm, I'm gonna rotate a little bit, a little bit more than that, but I, I'm gonna use it about every other time ammonium sulfate. Then go back 2020. Oh yeah. See, I, I, I go straight nitrogen after about the first It's according to what your phosphorus load is in your soil. Yeah. Is whether I would do that or not. Um, mine's pretty good. That that compost I got is pretty... Uh, if you have a high phosphorus load, I think you could get by with it. If not, I think you still would need to rotate some in there. Anyway, onions, uh, onion timing this year has been real good. I'd say better than it was last year as far as having plants ready. And... Uh, I'm yeah, you can definitely them. grow these things off quicker than any six weeks. You can grow them off in four weeks if you really pump it to them. Yeah, and there's still plenty of time. I mean, even down here, we have planted onions as late as late November, early, mid-December before. So yeah. if you, you're still on the fence about growing your own onion plants or you want to try some of these varieties that you can't get anywhere else, still got plenty of time oh, to yeah. make this right here happen. They are slower to germinate. They will take a little more patience. I've talked to a few customers who had some, they have some patient tissues. Mm -hmm. uh, these things take a little longer to germinate and get going up as opposed to a collard or broccoli, something like that. But once they get going like this, better watch out. And they just fun to grow. They fun to grow and look pretty in a tray like that. You know, we've got a couple of new things we've been working on in the last few weeks. And I'm really excited about these products because I'm going to need some of them pretty soon. That's right. I've got a new little fig orchard I have put in, and I've been having to water with a little water hose. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have... get old. It water. gets old, and we have come up with two new irrigation kits. One of them is a fruit tree kit, and another one is container irrigation kits. Mm -hmm. And these things are going to be wonderful for people that's got small orchards or that like to garden in containers but want to put an irrigation system on there. Yeah, and I, I, I thought about doing today's show on these kits, but I wasn't 100% sure with the new website how it was going to go. I didn't want to promise them being there and not being there. They, they will likely be on the site by the time this show airs, but next week we'll do a whole show on them, kind of give you a breakdown of all the pieces and components. It's really, really simple. A lot of the same pieces that are in our normal uh, drip tape kit. So this, you're not using tape, you're using main line and you hook these little emitters in it. Uh, we even got these little fancy flush valves to go on the end of your main line to keep them from getting any algal build up or freezing if you live somewhere cold. Uh, you got a little different hole punch. Got this little guy right here. Punches a hole with the emitters. But we'll go over all this next week. We should have these on the site, uh, like I said, as of the airing of this show. We'll have two different kits. The kits are going to be pretty much the same components, just different quantities. So the container kit, you get more, uh, I think, emitters than the fruit tree kit. Yeah, but if you've got a small orchard and you've been really struggling, I mean, this is going to be the answer to you. Or if you've got a bunch of those five-gallon buckets or grow pots or nursery containers that you grow in, and you're worried about it, it takes you so long when you come in in the afternoon because you have to hand water, this is the ticket right here. Yeah, that, that has become increasingly more popular over the years. Uh, people that have, I know Deep South, used, I don't know if they still do with their greenhouse, but they used to have just a row of these two. They look like five, 10 gallon containers, long, long 
row or two of them, and they, you, you need a good way to water them. Yeah, the biggest drawback with these container garden is watering because they seem to dry, it's just a lot with raised beds. They seem to dry out a lot quicker than in ground plants do. They grow off a little better or a little better a little sooner because they have more heat because they're out in the ground. Weeds are a little easier to control, but water's always been an issue there. So this right here situation will help that a lot. So y'all be on the lookout for that, and we'll, we'll try to cover that next week. This week, uh, we, I decided to do an all Q&A show, because we got some good questions here, and some that might take a little time. I might have a filibuster on a few of them. And so I think we got eight questions here we're going to bust through. And um, a lot of stuff about onions, a lot of good questions here, and I didn't want to just answer a few of these, so I decided we'd uh, not have a main segment and just go through some of these good questions from last week's show. First one's from John Mendez, and it says, question to the show regarding onions. If I'm growing onions in the designated intermediate area of the country, but the plot on my property is located deep, down deep in the holler. In the holler. In the holler, that means way down in the bottom, mm -hmm. where the sun don't come across the mountain till 8 or 9 a.m., such as a mountain area of Appalachia. Appalachia. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there. Then should I be using short day onions? What What you say, Travis? Should you be short day onions because this daylight is going to be cut back? We, you know, Randy Travis, his love was deeper than the holler. Yeah. Um, Man, he's making me talk about deep in the holler. And the sun will come <laughs> up at eight or nine a.m. He's giving so, me mountain fever. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's back up here. So short day onions are going to. Bulbing is going to be triggered when day length reaches between 12, 10 to 12 hours. Intermediate day onions, your day length is going to be triggered at 12 to 14 hours. Now, if, you, if he is indeed deep in the holler and it, his daylight is, is delayed, one thing he's going to want to be careful with, he might not ever get to 12 to 14 hours of daylight if that holler stays dark in the morning time like he's suggesting. So that's one thing I was, if, if you're not going to get to that 12 to 14 hours of daylight, what you're going to end up doing is growing onions with just a bunch of top because you're never going to get that day length triggered, uh, the bulbing triggered by that certain amount of day length. So if that is the case, yeah, I think you could certainly grow short day onions and you would want to trigger that bulbing at 10 to 12 hours. The one thing to consider there, if you are going to grow short day onions, John, is getting them in the ground soon enough so you can get enough vegetation on them when you do hit to that 10 to 12 hours. That's a very unique problem he's got there. Yeah, that's what happens deeper than the holler. Deep in the holler. All right, number two is from David H. And um, he says, how are you onions doing you start in the raised bed compared to the ones in the tray? Now, we had talked about this. We were doing a little experiment, <coughs> and you were growing some in the raised bed, and I've been bragging on my tray onions. So what's your verdict there? Well, my little raised bed there that I planted was a full before, and they've grown up okay there. The problem's been the weeds. You just can't control the weeds in there as easy as you can. It the takes trays. long to germinate. It takes a little long to germinate. The trays are such more of a controlled environment. It's just easier to grow them off in. If you have the ability to grow them in trays, I say that's the way to go. If not, second best thing is raised bed. But I definitely would give the trays my first choice. If you're going to really grow them in a bed, and not a lot of people are going to want to do this, but... Uh, the way the big boys, they use pre-emergent herbicides. You about have to, don't you? It's tough. It's uh, tough. So, yeah. I, I, well, I didn't know if you hadn't talked about it because you hadn't forgot about it or you just kind of you just kind of realized you had, you've been spanked. I kind of, no, I spanked. I may be padded a little bit. But I, <laughs> the, uh, the, trays, the trays are a lot, lot, uh, lot better. And you, for most folks, Plenty, you can grow plenty of onion plants in one end. Yeah, onions. you know, I I tell you what I would do. With this right here, fill your pot and soil up to about half of that, and you, you can just, just put, would you drill some holes in there? And, uh, yeah, I would drill some holes in there. Maybe next year we'll have some holes in. Them. I would drill some holes in. Them. Yeah, I've seen people do that. Just take that and just sprinkle them everywhere. Yeah, I think you could probably easily get a hundred plants in there. Keep them in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. The trick is, see, that seed start mix is sterile. Any garden soil or whatever is going to have weed seeds in it, even just a few is going to cause you problems. Yeah. 
You need, really need to be planting them in a sterile mix there. Yeah, that would be my second choice. You could probably do it now. If somebody had a little container or a pot, you could do them in there. Sure you could. Sure, you could. Mix sure. In you, there. you can do it in a raised bed. I'm just telling you, they, they, we've done better with them in trays because everything's controlled better. The moisture's controlled in there better. The fertility, we control that. We just have everything there when it needs it. We're in a raised bed. If it rains or whatever, you may let some things go lacking in that tray there. We go to the greenhouse every day and we, just like when we're growing our breasts, because we baby them. We, we put everything when they need it, it's there. Give them that love. Yep. All right, the next one is from Don't Piddle My Life. Man, that's pity. Don't pity. Well, I got my glasses Piddle, on. that's what you've been doing. Piddle, yeah. Don't pity my life. Would love to know if you have any tips on growing leeks. I've been reviewing a lot of your past shows, but mostly just hear you talking about they're easy to grow. Sadly for me, that has not been the case. I am in Zone B, so California, the Southern California coast, and I've never gotten them fatter than a pencil. But further up north in California, they grow amazing leeks. Not sure if it's a zone issue or what. No, I, I don't know. I've never tried growing leeks that far south, but I don't see why it would be an issue. Uh, I treat, I got some leeks I planted just for a week or two ago. They just starting to come up. And uh, leeks, to me, I treat them exactly like I do onions, initially at least. They're going to look a lot like these onion transplants I showed you earlier. When I put them in the ground, I want to plant them. Them onions, I don't plant deep at all. Just cover up the little white part. Now, leeks, you don't plant them deep. I like using a broad fork. You can use whatever you want to. We want to plant them deep. And then they just like onions, really, as far as their fertilization and their feeding. They're going to like plenty of water. You're going to need to give them a good, complete fertilizer initially and then just kind of pump the nitrogen to them. And then if you want the nice, big, long, white, edible part on there throw a little more dirt to them as they grow uh it's just a you know you got to realize they're heavy feeders like onions that's important and then planting them deep is going to be important as well i grew leeks for the first time last year i had decent luck with them yeah yeah the healing is the uh the key part there and uh and getting them planted deep that that's that if you want the nice big ones that's the way to do it. I had to do some more work on cooking them. I'm not a real good... Uh, Man, I made, we made some leek and tater soup last year yeah. that was absolutely off the chain. Uh, number four is from Frank Bernard, or Bernard. He says, what are your thoughts about using a pre-emergent such as Prowl? I not heard of Prowl a long time. For weed control in the market garden. Yeah, I don't think there's a problem with it if you want to go down that road. Prowl, the... Uh, Active ingredient in Prowl is pendimethylene, which is an old, we call them the old yellow herbicide. It's been around for a long time. I don't think Prowl is available to the home gardener at your big box stores, but uh, you can buy it at your farm supply place. It's pretty relevant, readily available there. It's used a lot on uh, in uh, commercial vegetable production. It's used a lot in the lawn care industry. It's used a lot in row crops. Uh, works pretty good. You can, matter of fact, you can. It's labeled. You can uh, do your onion transplants. Now you need to water them in first because you need to firm up that dirt around them. But you can spray prowl on the top of your onions after you transplant them. Huh. Then you'll need to water it in again to activate it. Prowl is a pretty decent pre-emergent herbicide. Now we talk about pre-emergent herbicide. I'm just going to throw a little bonus out there for you. Okay? Uh -huh. Are you ready for this? Go ahead. Most people <laughs> think this prowl pre-emergent herbicide keeps that weed seed from germinating. That actually is not true. What happens when that weed seed sprouts and it puts that, that white tender root, the very first one that shoots out of there, shoots out of there hunting some good fertile ground to peg down in, and it runs out there and it hits that chemical, prowl, and it dies back. And that's what causes that plant to die. But it doesn't keep the seed from germinating. The seed actually germinates and then shoots that tender root out there, and that's when it zaps it. So why does it not inhibit the onion root growth? You know, that's uh, the class of chemistry sometimes, whether it be dicots or monocots sometimes has an issue on that. But I have never found anybody that can answer that question for me. And believe you me, I've answered it, I've asked it a lot of times. Yeah. Treflan, Treflan is used extensively in vegetable production. And you incorporate Treflan or water it into your soils in your plant, 
And why does it not let one and but let the other one go? I don't know. If anybody knows that, let us know because I would. Sure somebody I've knows. been asking that question for years and years and years. Now, on some of your some of your post emergence, I understand that we're talking about strictly pre emergence. What's the select selectivity on some of your pre emergence? So besides the monocot, dicot, I understand that with atrazine, but on the prowls and the uh, treflans and stuff like that, I don't I don't understand that. Yeah, yeah, I don't uh, I I don't. I like to, to understand it as well. Not that I'm going to ever use any of those, but it's just interesting. And next question comes from Kobe Stowers. And he says, excellent show as always. Thank you. Have either of you watched Kiss the Ground on Next Flim? I thought it was an interesting documentary, but I have would have liked to see more insight from farmers doing the no-till thing. I'd be interested to hear what you think about what you two think about it, next flim? What is next flim? Next flim, next flim is obviously something you don't have. You don't watch. You don't, I don't. I got no. I, I hadn't heard of this kiss the young, ground on the next the, flim. With all the youngsters, that's the phrase. Is uh, instead of going on a date, they Netflix and chill. That means they they go. Over to how did I let, how guy get next flim? Net Netflix. It's just a you just pay for it. Monthly subscription. Or you find somebody's got one unless you borrow it. I may just it. have to go over to somebody's house and watch this. Yeah, you might have to. Anyway, we had a lot, quite a, a, a few people talk about this Kiss the Ground documentary on Netflix last week. And I, I wanted to do my homework before I answered this question. And so I watched it last night, and it was really, really good. thought it was good. Uh, Woody Harrelson was narrating it. Um, and and I, there was nothing on there that just jumped out at me as, as contentious or things that I would just blatantly disagree with. But I did write down a few points here uh, that I have on it, and I, I'll try to go through these. So the first one, uh, and this is just in general. So a little background, when I was at the University of Georgia, some of the graduate work I did was on carbon global carbon cycling and we were studying in particular the stuff called marine snow here we go again <laughs> so you got in in the in the deep ocean you got these aggregates of plankton and fecal pellets and all this stuff and when they get so big they sink and they fall down to the ocean floor and that's how a lot of your carbon gets from the atmosphere the ocean absorbs a lot of it and that carbon sinks down there and it's all a big part of this global carbon cycle, which is important because that's what they're talking about on this documentary. Anyway, I said that to say this. I, when I was up there, I worked with a lot of climate scientists because the model we were using had to use a lot of what they call global circulation models, which is used for these climate predictions. All this climate science stuff. So I worked with a lot of professors who use these models, study these kind of things. Um, and what I understood after that experience is that some of this science is not bad science, but it can be skewed a little bit. Because what you have here Amen. is you have the people who are funding this research are on the left side of the political fence. Or the right side. Well, in this case, yep. in this case, it's the climate research. The people that are funding this particular research, like what I was doing, are on the left side of the fence. So then all your professors are, are mostly liberal. It would behoove them to produce results that agreed with the political beliefs of the people who were funding the research. Not saying it's bad science, I'm just saying you have to kind of understand that when you're looking at any of this climate research. Now, you see the same thing happening on the right side of the political fence. You see companies like Monsanto and other large companies funding research to say that their practices aren't that bad, and that research usually comes back and confirms what they're trying to preach. So it, you, get, you see it all the time both ways. Both sides of the aisle are to blame for skewing research a little bit here. Yeah, especially with the land-grant universities, but all your research is funded. And those funding comes from a think tank, a nonprofit that has an agenda, or a public company. It can come from anywhere. But they've always wanted a particular end result. The funding is not apolitical. It's always political, politically driven. Usually. Yeah, but it, they always want a particular outcome from the research, the people that fund it. When, when they do that, they don't do it with an open mind. Okay, well, 
what if so and so happens? That's not the way it happens. They want a particular outcome, so they 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 structure it so that they get that particular outcome. So any kind of research that you see comes out, take it with a grain of salt. I wouldn't say take it with a grain of salt. Just I do. I don't. I don't put a lot of faith in those. A lot of those research. I would say take it with a grain of salt. I would just understand that some of the predictions, some of the prognoses that are that are derived from the research can tend to be a little bit extreme. That, that's what I would say. Anyway, so uh, in this particular documentary, I didn't see any super or what I thought were outlandish takes or, or statements as far as uh, climate change or the you know anything the environment like that. I thought everything was was I wouldn't say exactly on point, but nothing jumped out at me as like this is absolutely ridiculous. Now. So the, the whole point of this documentary, what they're trying to say is that we've got all this excess carbon in the, the atmosphere, right? Now, yes, we need to find ways to reduce our putting more carbon in the atmosphere, but what do we do about that that's already there? And what these scientists have, have come up with is that, that if we can increase or, or increase our soil structure, uh, or soil biology. The soil biology, the way we do agriculture in this country, then that will absorb a significant portion of that carbon and actually get us into more of a, what they call it a global cooling pattern instead of a global warming pattern. Okay, so then they, they go into um, the, the issues with today's modern agriculture and, and talk about how it has created this process called desertification where you just basically have all this lifeless land out there that is being farmed. The majority of it is being farmed to feed livestock. Um, there's a guy on there, I think it was in North Dakota, he had was a com traditional commercial farmer and then a few hailstorms and a drought just made him joke broke and he had to change the way he farmed just because he had no other choice. So he goes into a thing, and I think he's on point with this, and he talks about how, you know, subsidized farming is basically corporate welfare, and uh, that it is destroying that whole structure uh, of subsidizing large-scale farming is, is kind of destroying our land. Not on that, but it's not sustainable because it derives or depends on a income stream from the government. Right. Uh, so, so the the video is basically say, or the the documentary uh, is saying that if we could go, if we could transition the way we do farming, large scale agriculture, to more no till mm -hmm. techniques, we could sequester a lot more carbon from the atmosphere. We'd have healthier soils just a healthier globe in general. Now, there are a lot of farmers that around here, a vast majority of them, that do no-till. But they don't do no-till in the sense to build soils. They do no-till because it's the cheapest way for them to farm. Cha-chang. And because it's, they found that it's a good way to keep pigweeds from going crazy on you. Uh, less trips across the field, less diesel to be burnt. They used to round up because it's cheaper and I mean, it's just easier for them to do. They call it, a lot of them call it chemical farming. Now, some of them do cover crop, but from what I understand, most of that cover cropping is subsidized as well. Yeah. So that they only do it when they're paid to do it, which is, you know, you, you would like for them to do it because they want to yep. build the soil. So that's a good point what you bring up there, and I agree with it totally. The problem is economically, how do you make it happen? That's where the whole problem comes in at. How do you make that happen on a scale that is beneficial for the for the farmer? Well, you know, and, and a lot of the bad practices out there, which result in bad education, a lot of these farmers, as they demonstrate in this video, a lot of the commercial farmers nowadays, they, they don't understand soil building. They just understand a certain narrow way they were taught to do something growing up, to grow cotton or peanuts. Well, but also you got to look at it from this standpoint. So a lot of these farmers nowadays may not own the land. They may be renting the land. They don't know if they're going to be there another year, another five years what. So they take it on a year-by-year -year basis. They milking it. And it's a profit thing. It's a, and you can't, I'm not blaming them, but it's just the way it is. So they're looking at it from a profit loss statue of one year. They're not going to do anything to build that soil because they may not have it next year or the year after. And it's not their soil. Right. So it's hard to, to get them to make an investment in it when they don't know what their terms are going to be. And the whole system is set up for them not to care about the soil. Um, other things that I thought about, 
you know, with these t cover crops, if you do start doing some intensive cover cropping, doing no-till planting into them, which you can do, how do you terminate that cover crop? You know, that's going to be more costly for the farmer. They use Roundup around here because it's cheap. If you start going in there to crimp it or roll it or mow it, that is going to drive up the cost for the farmer, which is going to eventually drive up the food cost. And, and if we were, were all to commit to this style of farming on a large scale, we would likely see food prices increase. Now, some people might be okay with that. There are many other people who are struggling to get by, which, which might have a hard time with that. Some of your hardcore activists out there say that our food is too, too cheap anyway may have a point it could be it could be but that, that could cause a, that could cause create, an imbalance create some disturbance and whatever so it's anyway. a complex issue that there's no easy answer to but i think it's worthy of discussion i think it's worthy for us to work on i agree i agree and i, I like i said i enjoyed the documentary i didn't think it was it was uh real far left obviously it wasn't super far right but i i, I thought it was it was really interesting to watch, a good watch. You, you got an hour and a half, you got Netflix, sit down and watch it. It's called Kiss the Ground. And uh, there's a lot to learn there. And like I said, it, it wasn't trying to push you in one direction or the next necessarily. It was just trying to educate you on, on what we can do as a group effort um, just to make things better. Kiss the Ground on Netflix. If you uh, if you watched it, let us you know your thoughts. My net I'm going to have to find somebody when my neighbor's got some net film so I can watch it because it sounds like somebody enjoy watching. All right. So what I do, just ask them. I know knock on the door, I said, you got net film? Yeah, what's your net film login? You need to log in. Oh, if I got login, I can watch it at my house? If you got login, you can create your own little profile there. And, uh, yeah, and you, you can steal it forever. Net film login. Net film login. That's what you need. Okay. Yeah. That's what I yeah, you do have a smart TV. I do know that, so you can get on it and you can do that. You watch YouTube on Not on my TV. I personally can't get it on there. Some of my family members can get it up there and I can watch it on there, but I can't by myself get YouTube on my smart TV. Technically challenged. Technically challenged. Okay. All right. Now However, I can grow a good onion, a good okay. tater, and I can good tomato. I can do all that. A lot of my tech smart friends and family can't do that. So we all got our battles. We had to. <laughs> I got you. All right. Speaking of onions, number six, Carol Perry says, what are your thoughts on adding humic acid powder in the soil when growing onions and garlic? I think it's great, Carol. I think you forgot it. I think put it out there. It's not going to hurt anything. The problem with it is, is you're not able to order this stuff. And normally, most of the time, what I've seen on the Internet, you order it in pounds or a pint or five pounds at the most. You're not going to be able to get enough of it to make a huge difference unless you're doing just a little bitty area. If you got a four by four raised bed, yeah, it could make some difference in that. But if you're doing a 25 foot row, it's going to be, it's not going to be feasible to put it out there in the quantities that's going to make a difference. It would take a lot of it. What I like better is some good quality compost because good quality palm compost has humic acid, fulvic acid, and worlds of other beneficial uh, fungus and uh, beneficial activity in that that's going to help. So that would be my go-to, would get some good compost, put it out there, heck, maybe ton and a half, two tons to the acre, you can break that down. It's hard to overdo it with good compost. Put it out there and that'll do wonders for you. I've been known to put three tons per thousand square feet. Yeah, you go a little low, but you don't burn with it. No, right? no, no, we don't burn. You better they, get out of the way, Hatton. They were actually, when I get to spreading it, you better get out of the way. They, they actually mentioned that in the documentary, talking about compost and, and humus and stuff like that and how, um, how, how that was another part of the equation. Next question from Jesse Denton. I live in Zone 7A. I have my Savannah sweet onion seeds in my plug tray and covered with perlite like y'all said to do. Do I need to put a light on them or heat mat or do I just leave them in an unheated greenhouse? I'm gonna bring these puppies back out here as I talk about them. So, uh, I have got some, I think eight trays of onions in the greenhouse and I'll be getting, starting to get some of these in the ground soon. I got the plethora we started on the, tra on, on the show. Uh, a week or so after that, I got a tray of cougar started. That's what this is. Um, 
And then after that, or that same day, I did a tray of Carta Blanca white onions. Then a few days later, a week later, I did some duster. And then a few days to a week later after that, I got some Savannah Sweet, some Sweet Aged. Anyway, I got about eight different varieties, and I started them all at different times. And so our greenhouse, we have the sides rolled up. So if we get do get a cool spell, it can get equally cool in there. And what I'm saying here is uh, I didn't pay any attention to what outside temperature was, and, and it's been fairly rangy here the last month. Rangy. <laughs> and so I have started my onions in a wide range of temperatures, I feel like, within a 20 degree range, and haven't seen any differences in germination. Now, I don't know what the ideal germ temperature for onions is, but the range seems to be pretty wide, and we haven't, as you can see, had any germination issues so far. So uh, I would say no heat mat, even in zone 7, you wouldn't need a heat mat. Um, I think you're fine growing them in your greenhouse. Most greenhouses around here are a lot warmer than ours because, like I said, we leave the sides rolled up. So, yeah, there shouldn't be no problem. The only thing I would mention is if it do, you do have a hot day, keep an eye on the sails. They dry out pretty quick on them hot days. You want to make sure they got plenty of moisture in there. It's in these 338. So yeah. ain't a whole lot of soil there uh, compared to the, the plant. Your plant to soil ratio is a little different. And uh, they're going to need water in two or three times a day. Last one is from Nelson Cobbs. I don't want to say Nelson Knobs. Uh, Nelson Cobbs. So how long does it take for English peas to germinate? He's in zone 8 in Texas. What should be the soil tent for germination? I planted some probably about 10 days ago, and mine came up in 7 to 10 days, which is normal. What They'll come up in in good soil conditions, good soil moisture, and good soil temperature. Somewhere in the range of 60 to 70 degrees is ideal. Plenty of moisture should pop them out of the ground in 7 to 10 days easy. As always, plant them English peas thick. They are a little bit slower to come up than your regular peas. In the fall of the year, you want to get them up before that cold weather rolls in here. I like to get mine about this tall before that frost hits them. That way they can withstand it. When they're small, man, they just don't do good with a hard freeze. They'll get stunted. So plant them, get them up like this right here before the cold weather gets in there, and you'll be fine. To answer your question, seven to 10 days. Your yeah, English peas like that in between weather, like, mm -hmm. that, like I say. I got some about this tall. They mighty slow to grow in the beginning. Once they get going, they'll get going good. They are slow to get going and uh, test my patience sometimes. But well worth it when you start eating them. When you can start harvesting them. them did you plant the sugar prints? I did. Now, I tell you the reason I planted that sugar prints is so I can gather the early ones as snap, sugar snaps. What we call snow peas. Put them in my salad, or you can let them mature out and have the regular peas. I thought that was a great. Uh, great variety that you could do both of with. That's one of my favorite things to put up is English peas. Yep. You can't get, you can't have enough of them in the freezer because when it gets hot, we can't grow them. If there's one crop out there that there's a major difference in buying them in the store and growing them out in your garden is English peas. Totally different taste. So much better out of the garden. I really don't care for them out of the can, but I love them out of the garden. Eat them raw, heck. Yeah, Ty Ty, he'll sit there and eat a pastel of them. Yep. All right, hope everybody enjoyed that kind of extended Q&A segment. And if you have any other questions or comments on any of our uh, responses to these questions, we'd love to hear about it. Go check out that documentary if you can and uh, let us know what you think about it. Try to keep it clean. You know, we don't want any political divisiveness in our uh, comment section. But uh, keep it informed, keep it educational, because that's what we're here for is just to help people grow their own food. Heck yeah. And, uh, you know, try to take care of one another. So, hope everybody enjoyed the show. And if you did, give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Ring that bell so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy this video, check out these other two right here. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll see you next time. Take care.